guess I can get started with some some housekeeping items while we're waiting for everyone to log in. So first, I want to welcome you all. My name is Lee Frame, and I am the director of the Integrative Medicine Program here at GW, as well as the Office of Integrative Medicine and Health. Um, and I am so excited that you all are able to come, even if it's not physically in person, uh, and to hear about this year's symposium, which focuses on longevity and wellness. So the housekeeping items, first, um, if you are not familiar with WebEx, at the bottom of your screen, you're going to see icons to open a chat, a Q&A, and your audio settings. You can also change the video layout via the floating icon at the top right. And if you have any tech issues, please refer to your attendee PDF that you've provided. Uh, and if you're still having issues, then you can send a chat to Karen Foote. So Karen is on the call, and she is our tech expert. So if you're having any technical issues, you can go ahead and private message Karen Foote, and she will try and help you. Uh, we also want to point out the Q&A feature, because uh, we're going to ask you that you submit questions that way throughout the event. We're going to collect all the questions, and then we're going to address them during the panel session at the end. So there'll be no time for questions between events, uh, between talks. But go ahead and submit them, and we'll file them away to talk during the panel session. I think we could probably go ahead and, and get started with some of our opening statements. Okay, so let me ask you because uh, I didn't realize I had to stay in, until later. So uh, can you say that again? Um, what time uh, are we um, supposed to stay? Panel session is at four o'clock. Four o'clock, I see. Hmm. Okay, and how long is it going to last? Uh, about 30 minutes. Okay. So, John, do you want to take it away? Okay, I guess uh, we're ready. So, uh, greetings uh, to you all. And on the last count, I think we have over 200 registrants from all over the United States and maybe the entire world. Uh, we have participants from as far away as Brazil, Russia, and Indonesia. Many more. I am John Pan, and I'm proud to have established the office of the Center for Integrative Medicine back in 1998 at uh, GW. So welcome to the third annual Sun Symposium and the first one to be conducted entirely over the cyberspace. And this is brought to you by the Office of Integrative Medicine and Health under the Department of Clinical Research and Leadership at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. This, of course, would not be a reality without the generous donation from my good and longtime friends, Pat and Margaret Sung, who funded the establishment of the Office of Integrated Medicine in 2017. So integrated medicine, as it was conceived in 1998, and to a large extent perceived till today as a practice of medical uh, practices that incorporates a variety of evidence-based medical and health practices in the care of illness. It answers to the question of what works best for what. but uh, more holistic in scope, it remains a form of disease intervention. Uh, for more than 20 years, I think we should now move the conversation to whole person health, which encompasses beyond the biomedical, but also the social economic aspects of health. Uh, given our current COVID pandemic, it is abundantly clear to me that building a stronger foundation of whole person health has to be the fundamental objective of, a, of our healthcare system. It is the goal of the Sung Symposium to bring you research and thought leaders to move this conversation forward. In our inaugural symposium back in 2018, Wayne Jonas helped us understand how healing works in our bodies. 
And last year, Aaron, Mayer, and Helen Levretsky taught us how our gut microbiome and mind-body practices can have profound effects on all aspects of our health. Since our inaugural symposium, we have now grown from one speaker to two speakers. And this year, we have a panel of four exciting and outstanding speakers, which Lee Frame will introduce you later. So before we do that, I'm really, really happy and honored to have Dr. Barbara Bass with us here today. Dr. Bass is the Vice President of Health Affairs, Dean of the School of Medicine and Health Sciences, and CEO of the Medical Faculty Practice Associates. She wears all the hats, and she's indeed the one that can move this whole health program forward. I am not sure whether he, is Dr. Bass with us already? Just looking, I don't see her on the attendee list. Is perhaps she's one of the call-in users? So shall we ask uh, Marguerite and Pat to give us a little remark? Yeah, maybe we'll move on and come back to her. Pat, Marguerite, you're up. Okay, now we unmute ourselves. Hi, everyone. Well, we would like to welcome all of you to our symposium. We have a very impressive list of speakers, and I'm sure we'll learn a lot about oh, a subject that every one of us is interested in, how to live long, a healthy life. Okay, we were looking forward to meet uh, Dr. Longo when the, the uh, symposium speaker announced us. I read his bio and was very impressed. So I got his book and read it. I was looking forward to meet with him in person. However, COVID-19 prevented that. But we are glad that through technology, we can bring this symposium to even farther reaches of the world. So we are looking forward to a very, very informative symposium. Yep. Well, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Looking at, I'm still not seeing Dean Bass on the list. So perhaps we might have to, to move on without her, unfortunately. So she was excited to be here. So hopefully she will join us. And if she has time, we can get her to say a few words uh, in between speakers. We'll go ahead and introduce our keynote speaker. So this year's Theodore and Cynthia Birnbaum Memorial Speaker is Dr. Walter Longo the developer of the Fasting Mimicking Diet and author of The Longevity Diet. Dr. Longo is the Edna M. Jones Professor of Gerontology and Biological Sciences and Director of the Longevity Institute at the University of South Carolina, or <laughs> University of South California, Leonard Davis School of Gerontology. He is also the Longevity and Cancer Program, he's also the Director of the Longevity and Cancer Program at the IFOM Institute of Molecular Oncology in Milan, Italy. Dr. Longo studied biochemistry as an undergraduate at the University of North Texas and received his PhD in biochemistry from UCLA, where he worked under calorie restriction guru Roy Walford. He completed his postdoctoral training in neurobiology with longevity pioneer Caleb Finch. He also received extensive training in immunology, endocrinology, microbiology, genetics, molecular biology, and pathology. The Longo Laboratory has identified some of the key genetic pathways that regulate aging in simple organisms and has demonstrated that the inactivation of such pathways can reduce the incidence or progression of multiple diseases in mice and in humans. The laboratory has also developed both dietary and genetic interventions that protect normal cells while sensitizing cancer cells to chemotherapy, interventions that are now being tested in many U.S. and European hospitals. With that, I'm very pleased to welcome Walter Longo. Walter, I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Thanks uh, for the invitation. And um, 
And uh, let me see if I can share this, share content. Okay, so <coughs> you can see that my screen now. And uh, um, so thank you, thank you. Uh, glad to be here and, uh, and too bad I cannot be on the East Coast, but uh, um, we will have to, um, adjust and do it this way and um so can everybody hear me yes we can okay and and the screen is fine right correct yes everything looks good and you sound good okay thank you all right so then uh, um i will tell you um the uh, the talk that i i will give you the talk that that i often give uh, which is focused on, um, on longevity, uh, but particularly on healthy longevity. And so uh, here's my uh, disclosure uh, statement. And uh, um, I um, always start with uh, this slide, which is uh, the question, how much longer will we live if we cure the cancer completely? And uh, in, most people will answer, uh, We'll answer uh, now. Presentation is blocked. Okay, this way. Uh, most people will answer, you know, 20 years, uh, 25 years, uh, but the reality is uh, uh, it's about 3.2 years. So if we, we were good enough to completely uh, cure cancer today, uh, we will live just uh, uh, three years longer or so. And if we cure cancer, heart disease, stroke, and diabetes, uh, we will add about 13 years uh, to life. And, and on the right is a, somewhat of a speculation, but a speculation based on, uh, on something that we've already been able to achieve in mice. So the, uh, it's basically saying, what if we were health as effective proportionally uh, as we uh, have been in mice? in extending the longevity of people, uh, what will we, will we achieve? And I think that the number is about 30 years, right? So if we were about half as good as what we've done with, with mice in humans, we could live uh, 30 years longer. And uh, um, so the, um, the field, surprisingly, uh, I would say, um, it's focused on, on gerontology. In fact, I'm in the School of Gerontology at USC. Um, you know, so the, the gerontology, the study of, of, of age and, and, and getting older. But I always, um, I came up with this word, the juventology. And the idea was, uh, and this based on the fact that I was always uh, much more interested in uh, how to stay young. So that as an organism, and, and from the, all, uh, the early days, we were looking at, uh, you know, yeast and even bacteria. And uh, UCLA, when I first started, and the genetics of this. And, and we were looking at, uh, what are the genes and the mutation that keep uh, a bacteria or a yeast, this unicellular, very simple organism, uh, young and, and very functional and highly functional? And how do we change? For example, we started, I started with this, this uh, yeast and it was living about, you know, five days. And then we could slowly make it live longer and longer. So it went from five days to 10 days, 15 days. And then eventually we got yeast that by a combination of starvation, and, um, and genetic, multiple genetic mutation could live 10 times longer. So completely um, reprogram the life of, of a simple organism. And that's you know, what I like to call juventology uh, because we didn't just uh, affect the rate at which um, the things went wrong at a certain point. We actually affected the program that keeps everything uh, functioning almost perfectly in this simple organism. And, and this is, uh, what I call, you know, juventology, studying the, the, the process that is responsible for keeping an organism young. And then in, in the last 20 years or so, the field has come up with this other term called health span. And, and that's a really important one because, um, you know, this what I call youth span. So how long can you stay young? And then after that, uh, health span, how long, even if you're not young anymore, uh, how long can you stay healthy? And uh, um, and this is replacing just the, the, the idea of lifespan because you can live, and this is happening to a, a large extent in the United States and not just in the United States, in Europe and many countries around the world, 
we are extending the sick lifespan. And so now, you know, the typical 60 year old uh, are, is, is taking two, three, four, five drugs. And, uh, um, and so there is not really health span uh, in, in, in spite of a longer lifespan. So health span, how do we live long and healthy? And, and so it, one of the, the pillars that I think is, is very important uh, in addition to uh, the basic research on aging, the clinical trials, the epidemiological research, uh, I always valued very much the centenarian pillar, meaning if you go around the world and, and look at all the populations that have uh, record longevity and all the people that have record longevity, what is in, what do they have as a common denominator with all these other pillars, the epidemiology, the, the basic research, clinical studies, et cetera? Um, but I, I also like the stories, and so the, the stories are very interesting. And this, this woman, uh, for example, she got 115 uh, years of age here in, in Los Angeles, and um, and her uh, secret for, for for longevity was never drinking or fooling around. And uh, um, and then um, you know Salvatore Caruso from southern Italy, from a little town uh, in southern Italy, has record longevity. Um, he also says something uh, similar. Uh, which is uh, his formula, his secret for, for longevity was no wine, no tobacco, no Venus. And uh, I always uh, uh, joke because um, the, he, in fact, he, he drank, uh, he used to smoke and he had, uh, uh, he was married and had children. Uh, so he wasn't really um, following any of the, of the recommendation that, that he, he preached, but, um, but he liked to say this. Uh, so, um, and then, you have someone like Madame Calmont, and Madame Calmont uh, uh, has the uh, holds the record longevity. Um, she made it to 122 years of age. She smoked until she was 117, and um, and quit. Uh, uh, at least she said that she quit because, uh, of course, not because of health reasons, uh, but because uh, she was embarrassed that she couldn't light up uh, the cigarette anymore. And so, uh, so now. We have the examples or the stories about um, you know, following all the rules, and we have the examples and the stories about following no rules. And uh, it, it, I think you know, journalists do tremendous damage uh, uh, whenever they they use examples like this and whatever stories they they hear uh, to uh, make a point. Uh, and one of these was done um, uh, with um, Emma Morano in Italy, who I followed personally for a number of years. Uh, she made it to 117 years of age. She was uh, one of the oldest, uh, I mean, she was the oldest person in the world and the third oldest in the history of, of this uh, planet. And, um, and the journalists love to say that she ate three eggs a day. She ate uh, raw meat almost every day. Uh, what they did not say uh, was that she had uh, six brothers and sisters, all of whom made it uh, over the age of 90. Uh, one of them, and both her parents made it over the age of 90 or, or close to it, and she had one sister they made to 102. So uh, why am I saying this? Well, the point uh, is uh, genetics, right? So so my talk is, is about genetics of aging and, and nutrition. Um, in, so one environmental factor and one uh, hereditary factor. And so, uh, of course, uh, in the rare, rare families where the gene seems to be so powerful um, to allow almost every member of the family to make over the age of 90, um, then, um, you know, these, these uh, uh, persons can, uh, in fact, uh, violate lots of rules and they stu still do very well. Um, you know, we don't, we don't know for sure, but we suspect and we see this very clearly for, for mice, for example, you can have mice on a fairly bad diet, but if they have, and we're going to talk about it in a second, if you have certain mutations, they can do very, very well, live a very long life in spite of the bad diet. And we are also going to see an example of, of humans uh, in that category. Okay, so uh, we, um, it is an integrative medicine symposium. And so the effort should really be, uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the medicine the way it's, it's done now, or at least uh, it's okay. But I think we need to move, uh, we need to add to it for sure and, and start treating aging and start, um, optimizing longevity. So how do, you, how do we intervene on, on a person to optimize healthy longevity 
and healthy youth first, but then healthy longevity. And so we, um, uh, beginning in the early 90s, a, a small group of us, and now it's just a big group, but a, a small group in the United, mostly in the United States, started looking at uh, what are the genes that control the aging process. So we uh, were working in this simple organism, yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Others were working on flies and others were working on mice. And, um, and so, uh, of course, we had the genetic advantage and they had the complexity advantage. So we very simple system we could manipulate. Like I said earlier, uh, we, we were able to get a tenfold lifespan extension uh, in, in uh, yeast that were both genetically mutated and, uh, and they were also, so in, we, in yeast for which we combine genetic intervention and environmental intervention, so a, a nutrition, a revolutionized uh, nutrition. Uh, but but what, came, what emerged from, from the work of these five or six groups uh, was that there are mutations that extend longevity in, in all the organisms tested, and, uh, um, and in at least at one set of these mutations, they cause dwarfism. So these uh, live two, three times longer than this, but they're dwarf, and they just have a mutation in the torus iscanase pathway. Uh, these little flies live almost twice as long as this, and they have a mutation in the IGF-1 pathway. And, and so do these mice, uh, uh, they have a mutation in the, um, in the uh, growth, hormone, uh, growth hormone receptor, uh, and they live about 40, 50% longer than the, uh, the regular mice. So, so single gene mutations uh, could essentially revolutionize uh, not just uh, uh, longevity, but also health and health span. And so, for example, these little mice uh, studied by John Kapchik in Ohio and Andre Barkey in, uh, uh, in Illinois, um, not only they live 40% longer, but uh, about 50% uh, uh, of them will get to the end of life without any uh, apparent diseases uh, versus only less than 10% for these uh, big mice here. Uh, for the wild type mice. So, so then a single mutation in the growth hormone or in the growth hormone receptor can really revolutionize not only the longevity of this uh, mammal, but, uh, uh, but also, uh, but also uh, the uh, health span. So then, uh, so we knew that the dwarf yeast had this record longevity in dwarf flies and dwarf mice. Uh, so what about people that had mu similar mutation? And now I didn't show it, but these mutations are in, this, in the same, I don't want to call it pathway, but I, I call it network. You know, there seems to be a, ne a growth network. Uh, and this ne growth network obviously has some trade-offs with the health uh, uh, network, uh, meaning that um, probably in lots of organisms, or maybe in all organisms, um, there can be either a focus on growing and reproducing uh, as, as much as possible, or stop growing and focusing on maintenance, focusing on protection, focusing on protecting the germline, so that when, when food becomes available again, uh, that process uh, can continue. And so, uh, so what about people that had equivalent mutation or mutation in the same network? And, um, and so we, uh, we were working on the simplest of all organisms, the, the, uh, at least the major model organisms for aging, which was yeast. And, uh, um, and so we thought, why not work on, on humans too, you know, and, so, uh, and see uh, um, what happens. And, and so we started in collaboration with Jaime Guevara uh, of Quito, Ecuador, who's an endocrinologist that had been following all uh, the, these growth hormone receptor deficient people, and which are the equivalent, of, um, essentially the same mutation as the mice that I just showed you a second ago. Uh, so what about these, uh, uh, these people? Do they live longer? Do they develop less uh, disease uh, like the mice? And, uh, and, the, and as I mentioned earlier, um, as soon as um, I went down there the first time, uh, you know, close to 15 years ago, um, I realized that they had a terrible diet, uh, they didn't exercise, they smoked, uh, they drank. So I thought, mm, this is not going to be easy, uh, and maybe we won't see anything because they seem to have such a bad uh, lifestyle that um, 
then maybe the mutations won't be uh, sufficient to uh, to uh, show us the effects that we see in mice. Um, but um, the, as I mentioned earlier, the mutations can be very powerful, and at least some mutations can be very powerful. And if you look, we knew from mice that the mice that had growth hormone receptor deficiency had low uh, level of uh, uh, cancers, tumors, and cancers. And, uh, um, and, and this is what we saw also for the people. And we also knew that the mice um, that are growth hormone receptor deficient, they gain weight. Uh, and in spite of gaining weight, they seem to be protected from diabetes. And again, here we saw these subjects, uh, the obesity prevalence is higher than in the Ecuador population, and yet uh, they have a very little uh, diabetes. So just as for mice, uh, we see protection from uh, um, cancer and we see protection from diabetes. And now other groups have, have uh, confirmed uh, this uh, uh, effect, especially on, on cancer in Europe and in the Middle East. Okay, so, so what about, um, so these genes, I just showed you, growth hormone, IGF-1, in all kinds of organisms and TOR, these uh, axes um, or, or network, if you wanna call it that, um, is now the role of these uh, is being confirmed in uh, many organisms and, uh, and there is a general consensus. A few years ago, we actually wrote a consensus paper with, I think, nearly 30 of, of the world top experts in genetics of aging. And, uh, and most people agreed. Growth hormone IGF-1 and Taurus cyscanase are um, important for aging and for the acceleration of aging. And so what controls both of these is the protein level in the diet, right? So, so if you take 100 people, and you put them on a very high protein diet for a couple of weeks or less even, you'll see the growth hormone IGF-1 signaling and the Taurus kind of signaling go way up. And if you take people off of protein, you just put them on a, on a diet that protein free, you see them uh, within a week or so go way down. You know, so it could be drastic uh, uh, changes just based on keeping everything the same and just controlling proteins. And uh, um, so, so if it's true that proteins control the genes that control aging and diseases, then shouldn't we see people that have a low protein diet uh, do better than those who have a high protein diet? And this is what we did uh, in collaboration with Morgan Levine, who's now at Yale. And, um, and so the, the question was, what about people in the United States and using the CDC database? What about people in the United States that have a low protein diet versus those that have a high protein diet? And um, uh, and when I asked Morgan to to do the analysis, she came back and said, "Makes no difference." Uh, and then I say, "Go back and let's look at uh, uh, younger than 65 and older than 65." Then she came back and say, "Now we see a big difference." So people that had very low protein diet or a low protein diet uh, did uh, uh, much better for cancer mortality risk uh, compared to those on the high protein diet. So high protein diet were at the fourfold uh, increased risk of, uh, uh, of cancer risk compared to those on the lowest. Uh, and now if you looked at 65 and older though, you see the uh, opposite effect. Right Now the, the 70, 80 year old reporting a very low protein intake was not doing very well at all. And this was probably responsible for uh, us not seeing any effect overall. So if you say, just ask the question, um, what about protein? What about people in the United States that have more protein versus those that have uh, less proteins um, that uh, you don't see anything? That's probably why this, this uh, uh, switch at uh, around age 65. And, th and this introduces the, the, the concept or underlines the concept of complexity in a uh, you know, journalist and everybody all, always wants a, a simple story, right? high protein, low protein, high fat, low fat, high carb, low carb. And, and, and obviously it's not like that. And obviously um, we need to pay attention to um, the, uh, the age specific uh, nutrition and, um, and not just nutrition. And, and why could, could this be? Uh, why would we see the a protein being uh, negative, having negative associations um, in 65 and younger and positive ones in 65 and older, so high protein intake. 
And this could be the, uh, at least one of the, the, the key explanations. So if you look at uh, 65 and younger population, those uh, uh, in the United States reporting having a high protein or very high protein diet, they have a very high IGF-1. And now multiple um, epidemiological studies suggest that in fact, an IGF-1 of 240 will be associated with prostate cancer, breast cancer, uh, colorectal cancer, et cetera. And, uh, and this is also suggesting that the CDC database uh, enhance, it works very well because see people reporting a, a moderate level of protein, they have about a mo uh, an in-between level of IGF-1 and those reporting low protein, they have a lower IGF-1. Now it's starting to get, based on other epidemiological studies, in the lower cancer risk uh, group, right? So this makes sense. Now you see, if you go to the 66 and above, the IGF-1, even in the high protein group, is already down to about the same or non-significantly different uh, from the low protein group of the younger individual, right? So, so now you're already getting to low IGF-1 without the low protein, and the low protein now may just be causing malnourishment, right? So, so somebody is 80 years old, maybe eating very little protein, uh, maybe um, maybe malnourished and and not uh, and no longer having really any benefit from this uh, malnourishment, but just getting the the detrimental effects. Okay. So then, um, the uh, um, what about uh, additional changes to the diet, and uh, um, and so. Uh, Richard Weinger, who was always uh, also in the same laboratory I was at UCLA with Roy Walford uh, a few years before me, he had uh, uh, the brave idea and crazy idea to uh, do a, a longevity study on monkeys. And, um, and this, of course, as you can imagine, lasted 25 years. Um, but the, the, the results, I think, are spectacular, but also very more complex than we uh, expected, not surprisingly. Uh, so. Um, so if you took, take monkeys and you feed them about 25% less calories without touching the composition of the diet, uh, and you do this for their, basically their entire life, you see remarkable effects on diabetes and insulin resistance. It goes from 60% uh, in control animals to 5% in the monkeys, in the calorie-restricted monkeys. Tumors, they decrease by, by health, and cardiovascular disease uh, decrease by 20, 30%. Um, so really, a remarkable uh, effects of the calorie restriction on diseases. And you, if you look at the age-related mortality, so the mortality uh, related to major diseases, you see there is a big difference between calorie-restricted monkeys and, and monkeys on the standard diet. But then if you look at all-cause mortality, you see how now the, the two the curves are very close to each other. And, uh, you know, in some moment, actually, the... the uh, the um, control are doing a little bit better, right? Then, then uh, when they're younger, they're doing a little bit better uh, than uh, than the color state of monkeys. Um, so this is suggesting there are trade-offs, and 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 so that if you push to to the limit with this uh, very low calorie diet for the entire life, uh, this could be good, obviously very good, uh, but potentially also very bad for other reasons. So. What about people? Well, Walford right here, uh, he uh, was brave enough and crazy enough to also um, himself uh, do a color restriction experiment on himself. So he went inside of this Biosphere 2 uh, area in the middle of the Arizona desert, and, uh, um, and he stayed there for two years with other seven people, um, and th they were called the Biospherians. And um, and the biospherians, I think it was a really pioneering, really remarkable uh, experiment, and uh, uh, although a pilot experiment, but I think most of what they saw was confirmed uh, by a number of, of, of uh, uh, formal studies uh, done on calorie-restricted individuals. And so calorie restriction reduces uh, the uh, risk factor for cancer, heart disease, diabetes, hypertension in people, as we've seen for mice and monkeys, um, and the results are really uh, spectacular, meaning that, but they're also revealing of what, uh, of what um, I, I already showed you, which is if you look at people before they enter um, Biosphere 2, 
these eight people had about um, an, an average uh, glucose level, fasting glucose level of uh, you know 90 uh, or so. And now they enter, they become calorie restricted and they go to about uh, 70, 75. Systolic blood pressure, they start from a healthy 110, they drop to a, a 90 systolic blood pressure. Cholesterol, uh, relatively healthy 185, and they go to a total cholesterol of 125 or so. So um, the problem with this um, is that, of course, you, you would say, oh, they're never gonna be diabetic, they're probably never going to be uh, develop cardiovascular disease, but uh, will they not? Will they possibly be more susceptible to other all kinds of other problems? As I mentioned for the for the monkeys, um, and and if you see here, this is Walford on the left uh, during the calorie restricted period in in Biosphere Two, and uh, and this is Walford, the very healthy Walford after he exited. So. He, you don't need to uh, be uh, um, told that this is extreme, and uh, and this individual, yes, will will have a very low blood pressure, a low fasting glucose, uh, but isn't it possible that that's too low of a blood pressure? It is too low of glucose. It's too low of cholesterol. Uh, and as we know that all of them can have good and bad uh, effects, and so we we have this idea that. They're all bad, and we've got to drive them down, down, and down. But uh, you know, cholesterol, for example, is at the center of the generation of, of lots of hormones, and so um, environments, etc. So, um, so um, it is um, uh, potentially uh, problematic to be driving uh, to be driving uh, these markers down to, to, to extremely low levels. Okay, so. Then, so this was when I essentially started my graduate school. I started, I was there when they came out of Biosphere 2, and I saw that, you know, they were pushed to the limit. And uh, so since then, and luckily we were working on the genetic, genetics of aging, which I already showed you, but at the same, same time, I was starting to think, how, how do we replace this long-term calorie restriction with something that uh, maybe keeping the benefits and not having the problems associated with it. So we knew that if you, as I mentioned, if you start bacteria completely, they live longer and they, um, and they become resistant, resilient. Uh, yeast, they live longer, they become resilient. Worms, uh, same thing. And, uh, and this is work by Matt Camberlin. And um, so, um, of course, we cannot starve, long-term starve, uh, mice and people, but uh, um, and so I mean moving twenty years ahead uh, to um, the fasting making diet, and in the fasting making diet was uh, the idea was what if we just starve? The original idea was what if we just starve mice and people for a very short period? Would these effects potentially go very long? Right? Could this be a moment of reprogramming? Um, and rejuvenation potentially that will be long lasting. This could avoid all the problems associated with, with long term calorie restriction that I just mentioned. And so we did that first with uh, mice, then with cancer patients. And then it turned out that if we try to uh, fast, water only fast uh, patients uh, before chemotherapy, uh, they didn't want to fast and the oncologist did not want them to fast. And so eventually the NCI and the National Institute on Aging. Uh, funded research, our research, to develop fasting mimicking diets. And uh, so it's low calorie, low sugar, low protein, high unsaturated fats, so high levels of good fats. And the idea was to, to control uh, what we are, uh, started to uh, understand as being markers for starvation or fasting. So IGF-1, IGF-PP-1, glucose, and ketone body. Right? So where the idea was, can we match, do a diet that is, if you will, uh, smart enough to uh, cause the changes that water-only fasting causes without the water-only fasting, you know, while providing nutrients and in a fairly, uh, you know, depending. I mean, we have different versions of it, but in some cases, very high levels of, of nutrients or, or relatively high levels of nutrients. Okay, so then if you look at uh, now, this is very relevant to, to COVID-19 and, and to the, the immunosenescence problems that we have now. So if you look at uh, white blood cell counts in young mice, they're, they're high, and then they go uh, way down in old mice. 
Uh, and, uh, and so if we, in middle age, started the cycles of this fasting mimicking diet for only uh, four days every two weeks, um, you see that uh, by uh, age uh, of 20 months or so, 21 months, so in fairly old mice, now we see a rejuvenating, an immunorejuvenating effect. So now the white blood cell number is going back to, um, to the, the uh, uh, youth, more youthful level. And we know that we publish a number of papers on this. We know that what happens is that the hematopoietic stem cells get turned on during the fasting, and but then it's only during the refeeding that um, um, that the expansion of white blood cells occurs. And not just the expansion. Now there's a number of new papers published in cell that are are, are showing redistribution. So the white blood cells that are now being redistributed from uh, lymphoid organs to the bone marrow, and then from the bone marrow back to the lymphoid organs and, and, and to the bloodstream. So um, very powerful effects of, of fasting and still poorly understood, but certainly we're starting to see evidence of uh, rejuvenation by fasting, refeeding, and, and now you already see the difference with the chronic color restriction. The chronic color restriction missing the refeeding part, right? The refeeding part, which now uh, we think is as important, if not more important, than the starvation part. So you start and refeed, and these cycles of starvation and refeeding are the ones that allow the, the this rebuilding. In fact, you see now the white blood cell number while the mice are still uh, fasting is still low, right? And then you refeed, and it goes back to uh, normal. Now, this is the, the, the white blood cells in circulation, but uh, um, but those may be the are probably the ones that, that matter the most for immunity. Okay, so immune system, we now know it's very, very important, probably the, the number one uh, sentinel against cancer. And overall, um, the, the tumors were reduced by 45% lifelong uh, in the mice that were undergoing FMD uh, compared to those under control diet. And, uh, but uh, if you look at this, these are tumors that are occurring at, in the control diet at 21 months, 22 months. And most of this now, you don't, you really only see one single tumor in that period all the way to 26 months in the mice on the FMD. And so not only there is a, a reduction of 45% of tumors, but now you see a postponement and lots of the tumors seem to be benign versus malignant. So really a, a revolution of, at least in this 57 black six mice, a revolution of the, uh, of the tumor incidence and, but also the tumor, uh, the age at which the tumor it becomes uh, um, uh, evident. Okay, so uh, if it is so powerful in killing cancer cell, could po possibly uh, be utilized in cancer treatment. And, uh, and so I'm just gonna show you one slide or, or a couple of slides from, from basic research. Uh, and that's about cancer-free survival in lung cancer and breast cancer model for in mice, right? So, and this is just, you know, essentially what mice, uh, are there any mice that are cured? And so if you look at lung cancer model, if you give them nothing, no mice are cured, chemotherapy, no mice are cured, and fasting, no mice are cured. And now this is like a low level of, of breast cancer cells. If you do that and you give no treatment, zero, and it goes to about 20% with chemotherapy or, or fasting alone. But uh, what I want to show you uh, is, of course, uh, what happens when you combine the, the, the fasting and the chemo. Now you have about 60% of the mice that are cancer-free, suggesting that this combination is, uh, um, is now very powerful. One is targeting specifically the cancer, the chemotherapy, and the other one is making, it, making the environment very difficult uh, for, the, uh, for the cancer cells, no matter where they are, uh, particularly in, in uh, association with chemotherapy. And, and so if you look at uh, clinical trials, I'll go through it very quickly. Um, but, um, you know, this uh, original one, 72 hours against 24 hours, you're starting to see if patients were fasted for 72 hours um, compared to the uh, 24 hours, they seem to be doing better as far as uh, side effects. And then uh, this, uh, uh, that was done at USC. This is done in Leiden, in Holland, uh, showing the uh, erythrocyte number and thrombocyte number and seeing protection uh, in the patients that were fasted before uh, chemotherapy, um, uh, uh, protection of these uh, cells, uh, also protection of DNA. This is another study uh, done at Charité Hospital, looking at quality of life and uh, patients that were fasted 
uh, and, and receive one, two, three cycles of chemotherapy, there is no difference in, in quality of life. There's no decline in quality of life, but this is not true uh, for patients on the normal diet. So suggesting that, you know, at least initial evidence on, on side effects and damage. Um, and now, unfortunately, I cannot show it to you, but I can show you the, one of the um, uh, general results. This is uh, just uh, about to be published in the next month or so uh, from University of Leiden, 125 patients. And, and just I'll, I'll give you that statement. You know, there's a five-fold reduction in um, in breast cancer patients who did not respond to chemotherapy. It goes from 27% to 5% um, in those that um, they did they were compliant with the fasting mimicking diet uh, compared to those that uh, did not do the fasting mimicking diet. So uh, potentially. Still early, but 125 patients, you're starting together with this is the trial number six or seven, and now there are a number of other trials. So it's starting to look like, in fact, uh, uh, this is a good, good idea, and um, and soon enough, this is going to be an option for, for, uh, for oncologists to, uh, in addition to standard of care, uh, add the, uh, the fasting mimicking diet, uh, uh, which is going to be called Xantigen. Okay, so why does it work? Well, it seems to work by, I call it that by confusion. And uh, uh, so what does that mean? It means that, you know, the, the, the chemotherapy or immunotherapy or all kinds of therapy targets something very specific. And that's great, right? And it seems to be essential for the efficacy. But then there is an escape route that is generated and, and the cells figure out how to escape immunity, uh, immunity, how to escape the chemotherapy, how to escape the kinase inhibitor, et cetera hormone therapy. And so the fasting is acting on insulin, is acting on autophagy, is acting on IGF-1, on glucose, ketone bodies. And these are just some of the many, many markers that change. And now keep in mind the cancer has evolved in, a, in, a, in an environment where there's plenty of sugar, there's plenty of amino acids, plenty of proteins. And since this revolution of growth factors and nutrients uh, is a problem, particularly when they're being hit already by, you know, a standard uh, therapy like immunotherapy so uh, so this looks very very promising and uh, and we'll have to wait and see okay so then what about um, the immune system uh, could this uh, well first of all we uh, I'm not gonna have time to show we showed that some of the cancers in some for some of the cancers fasting in fact potentiate immune cells from attacking uh, 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 to attack the um, the cancer cells um, but um, so this is part of why we were looking at autoimmunities, in this case, multiple sclerosis. And the idea was, is it just uh, the fasting refeeding making this, the immune system more aggressive, or is it making the immune system more sophisticated and more uh, younger, essentially, and, and more able to work properly? And so in this multiple sclerosis uh, uh, system model, which is an autoimmune encephalomyelitis model, uh, um, the, the mice that are injected this glycoprotein, they become they, they develop autoimmunity symptoms and MS-like symptoms, um, and they essentially become paralyzed. Um, if we give them a continuous ketogenic diet, this helps against this. this these are the clinical scores, so this, the the symptoms. Uh, this helps, but then eventually there is not much of a difference compared to the control. But if we start the fasting mimicking diet. Uh, either after they develop the disease or before or as they're starting to develop the disease, now you see a, a strong effect against the autoimmunity and autoimmunity uh, symptoms. Uh, and then about 20% of the mice, they go back to, uh, to mice uh, that are no longer um, uh, showing these, uh, these symptoms. And uh, uh, so why does that happen? Well, we're starting to see uh, the, and because of this, suspect that there is so, something of an evolved process here. So, meaning that on one side, the starvation uh, with the fasting making diet is causing the killing of autoimmune cells, and seems to be calling, causing a specific killing uh, or or a, a preferential killing of autoimmune cells. Um, but on the other side, is turning on the oligodendrocyte precursor cells, and is 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 uh, setting up the rebuilding of the uh, of the axons uh, and the, uh, so uh, um, stimulating the remyelination of the demyelinated axons. 
Okay, so what about clinical trial? Very preliminary, now we started a second clinical trial uh, in, uh, in Italy, um, and pretty soon we're gonna do a large randomized one, uh, but you're starting to see already just one cycle of the FMD able to improve the quality of life in patients uh, with multiple sclerosis, and, and in most cases, better than the continuous ketogenic diet. So this is a single FMD cycle lasting seven days compared to uh, more, uh, months of ketogenic diet. So again, as we've seen for mice, um, the, the, uh, the cycles of fasting, making diets and refeeding seem to be superior to the ketogenic diet. Okay, so uh, then I'll talk very briefly about Crohn's and colitis, another autoimmunity um, uh, focus on the, the intestine and colon uh, where uh, microbes and microbial particles and also food particles um, get uh, um, in touch with uh, immune cells and, and now you have an autoimmunity being developed um, that, um, that can be uh, chronic. Uh, so um, when one of the things that happens in the mice that are, are given this DSS uh, infl pro-inflammatory molecule, uh, intestinal inflammation, uh, pro-intestinal inflammation molecule, the, the, uh, the size of the colon uh, shortens also the intestine. You see from this to this. Um, and now if you start the fasting making diet after the, the colon is already shortened, you see a re-extension of the colon. Uh, interestingly, if you, uh, when we did water only fasting, this did not happen. I mean, some of the beneficial effects still happen, but uh, some other ones of the beneficial effects of the fasting making diet did not occur. And we suspect that uh, part of this could be that in addition to what I said earlier, promoting regeneration, promoting anti-inflammatory effects, the FMD is also containing lots of prebiotic ingredients. And these prebiotic ingredients we've shown in this paper are able to cause the, the growth of lactobacillus, bifidobacteria, and, and a, a, a number of protective microbes. And, and we've shown that, in fact, the, the transplant of uh, uh, the, the fecal, fecal transplant was sufficient to cause some of these effects, and, and the transplant of, um, of uh, uh, lactobacillus was sufficient for some of the effects, right? So, so suggesting that you know part of the effects of the fasting making diet are through not just the fasting property, but the the fasting property combined with the uh, with some of the ingredients that are. And, and the reason we did this is because of the centenarian pillar, right? So the the, the diets, the nutrition of all the longevity of lots of the longevity areas around the world, where uh, these ingredients are very common. So we we try to combine the the longevity diet with the with the fasting properties. Okay. So what about diabetes? Uh, now you see also in in mouse diabetes model um, an effect in, in anglycemia in the DBDB type two diabetes model. But more importantly, I wanted to show you the type 1 diabetes model, which is much more surprising. Uh, now, if we damage the red cells, our insulin producing uh, beta cells, we damage these beta cells with STZ. And now you have very little insulin production at day 5, at day 50. But if we start a fasting mimicking diet, uh, you see how now the, uh, the glycemia, the hyperglycemia goes back to nearly normal. And this, we can even stop the fasting making diet. And this continues now. Uh, so the mice are essentially free of this uh, um, uh, type one uh, insulin insufficiency. Uh, and the beta cells are now long-term effective in making uh, insulin. So now there's clinical trials that are being developed to, to look at the possibility that uh, this could work also for uh, uh, for autoimmune type 1 diabetes in, in, uh, in people. Okay, so why did, does this happen? If you look at this gene expression profile, you see that these are mice that are on a normal diet, and all these genes that are involved in the embryonic development, they're turned off, and they're at the minimum level. Uh, if you study FMD, you see how they all light up, or many of them light up, and not, some of them are, are Yamanaka factors, uh, and, and so early embryogenesis uh, markers. Um, and, and then on day one refeeding, lots of them are still there. So now you have starvation. The system seems to go to, um, to these embryonic development genes, and it begins a program uh, that has similarities to, that, to the program, the embryonic 
developmental program that generates the pancreas in the first place. And this program continues for potentially for weeks. Uh, we've seen some of the genes continue for weeks after the refeeding has, uh, has been uh, restored. Okay, so what about people? Uh, what about the fasting making dying people? So the trial uh, we've done, uh, and now we have several more that are finished and, and we're gonna publish them soon. And I can tell you everything we've seen here, we've confirmed. So that's uh, really, um, we're really um, enthusiastic about this. Um, and so uh, this was five days of a fasting mimicking diet once a month, normal subject age 20 to 70, uh, five days of the FMD once a month, um, and then no, um, we give no instructions on, uh, to the people to do anything differently during the rest of the other 25, 26 days a month. So they were given a box, they do this for five days, and then they go back to whatever it is that they normally do. And uh, um, so body weight, uh, and so these measurements were done at baseline, and then one week after refeeding after the third cycle. So three cycles of the FMD, you know, two months later, and then um, we measured it again. And uh, so body weight affects abdominal fat weight circumference, and you see now something very different from calorie restriction and lots of uh, chronic diets. You don't see uh, at least the relative lean body mass is maintained in, the, uh, in, in, in at least in one of the arms. Uh, also, the absolute lean body mass was maintained uh, during the FMD um, period. So, um, but then we saw these differential effects, and this is what's very different from calorie restriction, meaning that if subjects started with normal fasting glucose, uh, nothing changed, right? So the, there's no change. And remember, in, in calorie restriction, the glucose keeps going down, and eventually they have fasting glucose of 60, 70. Uh, here, you don't see that, but you see the pre-diabetic now dropping much more uh, drastically uh, in fasting glucose. And if you look at IGF-1, again, some changes in those that have normal levels of IGF-1. Remember the IGF-1 associated with uh, mortality in the enhanced uh, uh, studies, uh, but those are uh, high IGF-1 or very high IGF-1 to begin with. Now you see a, a, a much bigger drop uh, after three cycles of the FMD. C-reactive protein, again, those that had normal level, they did not have high CRP, nothing happens. And those that had high CRP, now you see, see a, a return uh, for most of them to, uh, to the normal uh, levels. Uh, blood cholesterol, some drop for those that have normal cholesterol, but uh, those that have cholesterol about 200, a much bigger drop. Okay, so what's happening? Uh, diet, aging, uh, genes, disease risk goes up. And then we see in this fasting mimicking diet, probably by resetting the system in some sense, uh, both intracellularly and cellularly. Um, and, um, and, and now uh, the, the, and now we're calculating biological age. Are we in fact bringing biological age in people um, uh, down? Are we making people younger? We don't know yet, but, but uh, we are uh, gonna uh, publish on that soon. And, and so these, uh, uh, these cycles of fasting making diet are now uh, uh, showing uh, reduced risk uh, for, for all, uh, risk factors for all kinds of diseases. So, so just to summarize it, um, uh, I, I uh, take advantage of my mentor, uh, Roy Walford, and uh, um, you know, a baseline is, is a healthy uh, individual. Then he undergoes long-term calorie restriction and you see everything shrinks and he shrinks and his liver, his lungs, and now we know all kinds of organs in mice, some of the organs can reach 50% smaller size uh, compared to before, let's say, fasting uh, mimicking diet is if we extend it to the limit. Of course, we don't do that for people. We have just a you know, much uh, less severe change, but this is just to prove the point, you know, what if we were to do, have people do a month of the fasting mimicking diet? Um, and that's, we probably shrink lots of the organs, the cells shrink, and, and um, we're still learning you know, what, what's happening in that period. And then eventually, um, we, Walford refeeds, and now within six months or so, uh, I forget how, how long this was taken after he exited Biosphere 2, but he goes back to normal. So now you see the re-expansion, whether it's muscle or many other organs, now it's going 
to a, a much larger size. And so in that process, now all these organs are now regenerating and re-expanding. And, uh, and with this regeneration, re-expansion comes a, a more, much more youthful uh, uh, phenotype. And uh, um, and with that, I'm, I'm going to end, and uh, you know, thank all the people that did the work. I mentioned most of them or showed most of them, but uh, of course, without them, uh, none of this will have happened. And of course, without the National Institute on Aging, uh, NIH, NCI, uh, NIA, and uh, uh, IRC, which is the um, Italian uh, Cancer Research uh, uh, Association. Thank you.